fun to do another interview. This time it's Jay Vine. He's come of age in the last couple of years as a pro cyclist. You'd likely know the story, and that is that he came through the Zwift Academy, got offered a, a gig as a pro. He's a Canberra boy. He's uh, married to Bree. Big news last week is that he switched teams. He's going to UAE Team Emirates. And I'm really keen to hear what he has to say about a career that's on the up and up and up. He really should have been the king of the mountains of the welter this year, but a crash forced him to abandon the race while wearing a polka dot jersey after having won two stages. It could be that Bree will join us for the interview. I'm not sure. I sort of asked if that could be the case. And here they are. Good afternoon. How are you? Good, 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 thank you. Nice to meet you both. I'm glad that I'm talking to both of you. I was sort of optimistic that that would be the case. You've hit uh, the, the pro scene in a big way in 2022, and it also sounds like you um, understand how to live the off-season. So did you hit it hard for the off-season, or is that just an exaggeration? Uh, no, I think uh, eight kilos. I think I gained eight kilos over Ooh. the three weeks. So, yeah, I, um, I aim to please. So... <laughs> Uh, and that was even with, um, doing some gym work and some running and some running. I think I did four kilometers of running. Um, Which is a lot of running for you. <laughs> for me, it's a lot. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, for me, it's mainly just, especially once I got back to Australia, it was mainly just doing things that I haven't been able to do in two years, you know, like. Geez, I was riding around a ride on lawnmower. I was whippersnippering, mm. working on a car, um, you know, hanging washing outside mm. in so, the sun, you know, instead of on a indoor clothesline with a fan on it in an apartment. So all that, all the, all the good stuff um, that I just haven't been able to do. So that's what I've mainly just just turning the mind off from cycling. Um, had a couple of interviews that I've had to do, but apart from that, I I didn't look at the bike for, you know, basically the best part of three weeks. So yeah, wow, twenty one days. That's just outlandish. How dare you? You know, like, uh, but did you actually maybe step on a mountain bike and have a bit of fun, or a BMX, or do a few jumps, or cut sick? Nothing. No, no. no. Yeah. I think even if you had a mountain bike, he would have only just hopped on it, like five days ago for some joy rides mm. but that's it like the idea is to give the body a proper rest like yeah. especially when it's a 24-hour job of what you do i don't think you would have wanted to jump on even if you had one yeah i'm sort of i'm building a mini cooper to leave at my parents house so that i can play with that when i get back um but yeah that'll be my my little go-kart to drive around uh queensland with mm. Yeah, okay. So, and you're in Queensland now, near Ipswich, I understand. And yeah. uh, do, we, do we call you a Canberra boy? Can you just explain your upbringing? So that uh, we're going back to basics here. I'm sorry. We've got a lot to talk about, but we'll try and sort of cover a few topics if that's okay. Yeah, um, defence family, so moved all over the place, born in Townsville. So they want to try and claim me, but sort of only started riding my bike in Canberra. So they want to try and claim me there. Um, Canberra's the right call. Yeah. You've been over there for years and this is the first time we've ever looked at each other. And um, I, I guess the pandemic worked well in the sense that it forced you to, um, to, to have that Euro base, to adjust to the lifestyle, to learn a language, to understand the culture that you're going to be living by the look of it for a long time yet. Yeah. How did you cope with that? Was I mean, not necessarily the pandemic per se, but just the whole adjustment of of, uh, of lifestyle. I think it was helped a lot by having a partner over there. Um, we we originally moved to Girona because we thought it was going to be a lot like Canberra, with a big cycling bubble, with established group rides, all that sort of stuff. But you know, also being of as Alperson said, uh, advanced age um of uh the ripe old age of 26 i did yeah absolutely i'm grandpa you know i wasn't <laughs> uh, i wasn't i wasn't in the brand new cyclist uh you know 20 year old i've just gone to the olympics and i've turned pro 
I'm not sure if there was a group chat that I missed out on when I moved there, but uh, I think I rode with four people in the 11 months that I was in, in Girona. It doesn't help. You're an introvert. As I'm well. an introvert as well, but um, yeah, there was, there was no sort of, from, from my perspective, there was no, oh, this is the cycling hub and everyone knows each other. Well, yeah, everyone knows each other, but everyone sort of keeps to themselves unless you're in that sort of cliquey group. So uh, that's why when when people say, oh, you live full-time in Andorra, how could you do that? It's like, well, it's basically it's really the same as living in Girona, only, you know, more it's, mountains. It, there's more mountains and the weather's a bit cooler during summer. Did you gravitate to expats or are you still sort of the introvert that you talked about? Um, so we've got our key friends that we go out and catch up with and spend a fair bit of time with. I've been branching out to the wives of other cyclists or girlfriends and catching up with them as well. Um, but since we actually moved, Jay hasn't really had a lot of downtime where it relates with other riders. Everyone's going back and forth racing. Like I think when Jay had downtime, Jack Haig was recovering and then Ben O'Connor as well, they had things going on. So it's, it's actually not a lot of time that you can catch up. We did do an Aussie barbecue with some friends in Andorra, but around May, I think. Yeah, around May, just with the Tour de France stuff kicking up. But that was really it. Like we have our set smaller network, but we still catch up with a lot of people and chat to them about things that are going wrong and how we can address it and stuff like that. Yeah. Hmm. But also, yeah, with my writing, I. I'm a big, a big numbers guy, and I definitely don't want to be missing the mark when I'm going out training either, um, or going too hard in in other spots. So I I definitely definitely prefer to train alone. Um, but you've done a few coffee catch ups. I've done a few coffee catch ups, but yeah, like the 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 main issue is you know if you're if you if you if you if you go in a group of more than two or even three someone's always missing out on pushing wind and you know unlike racing training is where you really want to be pushing wind that's a lot of intro out of the way especially given the context of what happened last week i mean there was some reports earlier in the week when um there was a, a denial of a team change and then there was actually confirmation of the team change uh that was a work in progress that sort of extended to before the Vuelta, isn't it? And um, can you just sort of give us a little lay of the land of how the new team uh, came about and if it was complicated to break what was already an extended contract? The Velo News thing was a bit amusing. I, I don't know why they got me to do an interview the day before the announcement came out, but um, I was, I'm was i under an NDA, so I wasn't able to, to talk about it. I'm still under the NDA, so I can't give out the exact details of it. But basically, this was all happening before Volta even took place. So, yes, I was approached by people after my wins at the Volta, but nothing came of it because this was already in the works. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that part you know, was, was completely accurate. And I did sign a contract through to, through the end of 23. Mm. And it's um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't understand why there's this big, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, uproar that I didn't tell the exact truth to, to, to the media. And I, I, I still think it's a bit bizarre that I was told to do the interviews the day before anyway but mm. yeah and we did try and go probably not a good idea but like you can only say so many things before people are like oh so you are going somewhere like it's a minefield and you can't say can't comment on it because then obviously no shit Sherlock you're going somewhere so it's, I don't know how other writers do well, it maybe I should next time next year when I get asked if you're leaving I should be like no comment and then I don't leave. That'll be fine. Mm, there is no way we could. Yeah, it's just people try and catch you out a bit too much, unfortunately. My my annoying thing was I that was a forty five going on fifty minute interview where you know I talked about 
the importance of downtime. I talked about the importance of, you know, for me, you know, my wife's support over the last 18 months in Europe and that none of that entered the interview. It, mm. it was that, that, that Velo News article was purely about me beating back rumours or denying that I'm moving. And mm. it was, that was a 30 second you said when you got, uh, when you read it, that article. It was, it was literally two sentences of comments from me and you know i thought there was a lot of other important stuff that they could have written about but apparently not yeah it's no got us a bit jaded now no oh, well it's pro sport life it can get nasty and weird and funky at times but it also is bloody glamorous and people you know um start to relate to you because they see you going up mountains in filthy weather conditions and you know going up mountains faster than pretty much the best bike riders in the world the first stage when, if we can just jump to that for a, a line of discussion, it was something that I found just totally engaging because um, I'm starting through television to get to know your style. Uh, I've not ridden with you, but it was pretty clear that you had an understanding of what was required numbers wise to, to hold on. But the second stage win for me was way more exciting because it wasn't from the breakaway. You rode away from the favourites. You um, were there already a marked man, et cetera, et cetera. Can you just give a little, I mean, it's, it's months after the fact, but the two stage wins must be front and centre of your mind when you're talking about your cycling career. Can you give a little summary of those two days? Yeah, I mean, the, the first one... Um where I didn't end up getting a photo was uh, <laughs> I said it in this the Velo News interview. Um, I do believe that I needed to come second a lot this year to be able to have the confidence to go when I did um, at the bottom of the climb when the the first two guys attacked to try and catch Padun, but and then then also not to look back and give everything in that moment. Um, but also throughout the day to save all the energy I could to manage my manage the descent in the wet, to manage the food intake, to, to, to have all that come together at the base of that climb and then also have the, the numbers to to complete the task at the end. Um, basically I was I was confident that I was going to win after we got off the flat section with four Ks to go because you know all I had to do was keep doing the watts that were in front of me and that 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 was it was they were the best watts in the race and like if someone had to match me and go harder than me and I mean that's it's like six and a half watt per kilo at the end of a, a 20 minute climb to, to try and to, to go f to, to equal me then you obviously have to do more watts to try and take that back that time so um that all, all the whole year culminated in that result. Um, funnily enough, I hadn't actually planned for it to be from the break, uh, for, from yeah. the, the GC group. It was meant to be a breakaway day for me. I was meant to be there with Padun, um, probably getting caught. Uh, but it just so happened that two Ks after neutral start, I got a flat tire. So I ended up missing the whole break formation fight. The stage eight win was a bit more tricky because it was going to be from the breakaway and managing the effort um, throughout the day and not going all in and too deep was was definitely weighing heavily on my mind because I have done that. I did that last year in stage 14, even before I crashed. And it just, it all sort of fell into place, having Pedersen there, having three FDJ guys there, having the, Pedersen trying to keep the group together until he got the points four kilometers before the base of the last climb. Like it all sort of culminated. Um, plus Stolaire as well being a big threat and having all these big names around. It, it, I just sort of got overlooked. Yeah, I think once once that first uh, that that ceiling was broken with the first one, I think it's there's there's going to be a lot more to come in the future. Hopefully, you've got more confidence from everything as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It was also the days that came afterwards, which were really impressive, where you were defending the jersey, you know, not necessarily off winning the stages, but it seemed to me like, uh, I mean, I 
I was just getting to the point of confidence thinking he's got the jersey, he's going to win the jersey. And then your bike racing took its toll like it does. We'll get to the injury in a sec, but were you um, as uh, as confident as, as observers were that you'd be able to last the distance of the three weeks and still have enough points had, had it not been for the crash? Um, well, annoyingly, we could have sewn up the jersey on stage nine had there not been this absurd, weird obsession by Quick Step to chase me down solely. Um, they were positive. They were positive. Remco was positive I was a threat for the GC. Uh-huh. Um, even though I told him that he was going to put two minutes to me on the time trial, um, if I went flat out, he ended up putting two and a half minutes into me if because I, I did 90%. But that says that, more about Remco than you, though, doesn't it? Is that, I mean, it, it, that, that's a huge compliment from a rider of his calibre with his reputation. He might be young, but everyone knows what he's capable of. Yes, but... It's, it's because you guys were head-to-head at Norway. In Norway, but it's it's still, like, it, it's still absurd to me. You know, you've got Primoz Rodjlik and Carapaz sort of still around there at the same time as me. And no, nah, I was the primary focus on the, on that day. But yeah, we, there was like 20 points available on that day. Mm. And that would have given me a 40 point buffer uh, if I'd been able to take max points before the final climb, even if I didn't get max points on the final climb. So we, we'd mapped out every stage with every point that was available. Yeah, I, I, was, I was feeling stronger and stronger. My five minute power was going up and up and up throughout the three weeks. Um, can you just, I mean, people are familiar with their numbers. They followed you on Zwift and everything, but can you give a, just a quick summary of what you just talked about there? Um, how, how you five minute power improving, improving what, what sort of data were you pushing out? Oh, I think I probably started at like 480 and then I think the last one I did was I think like 530 or something by the, by, by the time I crashed out. So, um, and, and your was, race weight in September was, you've said you put on eight kilos, but what were you in September? Um, 67. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Besides the fact that I trolled everyone by changing my weight in Strava to 73. Um, oh, okay. And, because everyone kept Oh, it's so funny. I, they're like, <laughs> oh, pro cycling stat says 69, but he says 73. But And then I wrote on Twitter that I was actually 78, so. I don't know. I don't what I don't what I weigh I was. It it just got to the point where we got so many messages going, what's your what's per kilo, what's your FTP stuff? And then we had because we've been so open about everything, we've had so many people message us going, Well, I'm not good enough then because my numbers aren't matching and how'd you do this? And it just it became just like it was a troll from everyone but we got inundated with messages and jay's trying to make the point of i'm a professional guy so you will not meet my numbers stop comparing and going yeah. i'm not good because jay vine does x focus on you focus on your watch per kilo mine does not matter so i thought it was fucking hilarious but anyway the day that i crashed out i was actively trying to get in the moves and that was the day that uh slight crosswind and people were in complete disregard for other people's safety and immediately chopping people into the gutter. So mass pile up. And unfortunately, I think, you know, Carlos Rodriguez uh, mm-hmm. suffered a lot, but was able to continue. I you had I'd, Mads go down in Mads, front of Mads you. Mads went down. Um, yeah. I, I still don't know how I managed to get a massive gash in my wrist, but oh. um, I'm 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 extraordinarily lucky to be alive, to be honest. Mm. So but, just yeah. to go through it for people who aren't, who may not not understand, but you had a huge loss of blood already. You had a deep gash. Which hand? I can't remember. Uh, my left hand. And you're right-handed. Yes. Okay, but that's just for the recovery question. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it was stitched uh, but it would have got your artery and, and it would have been just to copious amounts of blood gone you think yeah oh absolutely i yeah i as it was i did wasn't i didn't require a transfusion um because it was on the top of my wrist but 
I mean, they, they, they jokingly said, we might not need to x-ray your wrist because they could see the bones. It required 15 stitches, 13 on the top and two underneath. Like it was a serious uh, wound. Um, and then the movement after that, it took a while to get full range of motion again. Mm -hmm. Extremely lucky and also probably extremely stupid that I was on the trainer three or four days later um, because the way, the, my way of dealing with the crash and not being able to do the jersey was um, getting to Italy um, to, to do the spring classics. So that's, awesome. that's like, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't game changing for, you know, my career doing the spring classics, mm -hmm. like the autumn classics. Um, but it was just something that I really, I didn't want to finish the season with a sour taste like that. I wanted to go to Italy, um, you know, and race with um, the guys that I'd been racing with in, in Volta again to, to finish off the season. That was important to me. So you're moving on, but I, I clearly just from what you've explained there, um, there's a good rapport with the, the, the team for 2022 and 2021. Uh, is it going to feel a bit of a shame to leave it? Or, uh, I mean, the, the, everything's a learning experience. You're going to go and hang out with George Bennett. That's got to be fun. So, yeah. um, you know, there's uh, there's something to look forward to. But are you now that it's coming to an end, this um, uh, incredible, well, let's call it the Zwift Academy journey, because without it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have started. So do, are you disappointed to be moving on? Um, I mean, Experience. it's very mixed feelings. This is like high school, you know, ending high right. school thing. You don't want to really do high school again, but it's also a shame to be to move moving on. Um, I'm I'm really happy that I was able to have two stage wins with the two different DSs that were the key parts of my mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. um, Frederick Williams um, and I've forgotten Michelle's last name, but Michelle is the other DS, and they've seen me come second a lot. Um, Michelle was driving the car in 2021 when I crashed. So to be able to give them both a stage win um, was pretty special. Uh, and like the, the, the DS, the support there, all the second places that I've had, <laughs> with all the advice that I've been given to correct the mistakes that I'd made um, down to the point where I would go and debrief with them after I'd done something and be able to get advice on how I might fix that. And, you know, to, because, you know, I haven't been racing a bike since I was six. So I've only started racing when I was 23. So, mm -hmm. you know, all these little things, you know, and Michelle was a, a, an amazing bike rider in, a, in his own right. You know, he'll tell you a lot that he won tour of Luxembourg. So like very, very clever bike riders and, in the team as well. And and the, then the team riders themselves, you know, I I'd spoken to a lot of them, um, and you know, it was basically a a known fact, even though I didn't say anything uh, amongst the peloton that I was moving on, and you know, I didn't have any. There was no 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 bad blood, no nothing. I mean, it was clear that we were we were, we were all in for Tim Melier and. Tim had been announced. announced that he was off to quick step for months. Mm. Um, and that's, I think, not only the fact that we're professionals and we're paid to do a job, but also the the team atmosphere, the team environment. Mm. It had just been fantastic from altitude in La Plagna in France with that group of guys all the way through to the end of the Volta. It was just mm. so strong. Um, and, yeah, it's a shame, but... I'm looking forward to a new start. And is there a program mapped out for you? Like the, uh, there's been a couple of recruits, both with V's, both from a, a, a home trainer experiment, let's say. Um, are you going to follow a similar to, uh, trajectory to Vink or are you going to be Vuelta still? Are you going to get a chance to have a crack at the Tour de France? Are you, uh, what role do you expect to play at uh, UAE Team Emirates? Um, well, I'm off to a training camp in December mm -hmm. and yeah, so back to, back to Spain in December to get set up on a TT bike. 
Um, my goals are nationals and down under for now. I can guarantee you I will not be at the Tour de France. Um, mm-hmm. So there's that's room for others. there's room for another Grand Tour there. Um, I'm not sure what 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 else from there, but I mean December is when that'll all get sort of ironed out. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Main like the the op- the opportunity to set up a TT bike fully and then be able to ride TTs full full gas is going to be already really special for me because you know I I really enjoy doing it in Australia and you know it's it sort of reminds me of my mountain bike roots of it's just you pedaling hard and the best the best and the strongest and the smartest guy in the day wins it's it's a combination of all those things of pacing reading the way the road's moving the wind all that sort of stuff coming together yeah so when you were telling Remco that he's going to put two minutes into you, it's not because you consider yourself a TT slouch. It's just that you were focused on polka dots and you were climbing at that point. But you would be classifying yourself as a reasonable time trialist before you've really had a full gas uh, shot at it? Uh, well, the numbers are good. Mm. It's just everything else is slow. So, you okay. know, actually being able to put money and time and stuff into making myself go fast is... Mm is really important you know I, I i i was on a small time trial bike all year yeah okay. except for okay well, so that's going to be fun to watch the could i'd love to see a before and after you know like okay this is me starting out and this is the position that i've been riding for a few years as i learn my craft and then once you do all of the things that they're likely to do in the wind tunnel and push you here and pop, try that and tweak God knows what. It'll be uh, fascinating to see the aftershock. Yeah. Well, it's just something he's really enjoyed. That's mm. the main thing that we've been so excited about. Like Jay's really passionate. In Australia, he pretty good time trials and, yes, domestic level and everything, but the numbers are there. And it was something he really enjoyed doing. So even just being able to get a bike that fits, that he can have at home, that he can do his training, even that is perfect and like as we've been saying we want jay to eventually mold into a pure gc rider so mm-hmm. you gotta get there you can't be a slouch with your tts and the numbers he's been putting out shows like it's just practicing on the tt bike that is aerodynamic yeah mm-hmm. so yeah okay if you've been you haven't been in a wind tunnel then i haven't even seen a wind tunnel you haven't seen that okay <laughs> okay given the history you have to go back on the home trainer even you know even if it weren't for injuries like uh, slashed wrists and the like but when you uh when it's raining outside and it is home trainer day do you go oh bloody hell. or do you go oh yeah let's go what's the atmosphere like it depends on what session you have yeah, it depends what session i have <laughs> um i i don't know i find I, I didn't really do the indoor trainer like most people did. Um, I would, which is doesn't really work with professional uh, training and a professional coach monitoring what you're doing. I I used to go on, like sign on to the app, pick four races in a row with ten minutes in between, and I'd go from race to race to race to race and just ride them all full gas. So I do four hours or three and a half hours, you know, two hours, absolute full gas, everything in between, easy as anything. And that's how I do my training indoors. Now with actual workouts, it's, yeah, it's, it's completely, it's completely different. It's not, it's not as fun or engaging as what I used to do, but as is the professional life. Um, I, I I mean, I'm more than happy to do endurance rides because I just do the same thing I do outdoors. I pop a podcast in and I, I listen to that and away I go. But um, yeah, doing specific workouts is a bit tricky. Mm-hmm. And that's even with my aversion to ra- riding in the rain. Um, I don't really like riding in the rain in outside because I can't control what other road users are going to do. That's the main thing. 
Like mm. it's it's Especially just in mountains. it's just an external risk that I can't control, and I don't want to. You know, I might make a mistake. I might mm. go too late into a corner, and then put myself in a bad position with another road user, and it's just it, it'll be my fault. But if I can reduce that risk as much as possible, it's sort of yeah, a bit better. Okay. But- a full blown effort on Zwift, you're normally pretty keen, especially if we're doing like a race or something, because we used to do it together, but now it's very numbers focused. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the social aspect of Zwift is dead to you, like it's gone. Or do you now get called upon as a, as a graduate, let's say, and say, hey, do they come and say, Jay, can you just come and, um, you know, host a fun ride, a group ride, or well, I don't know, there's a myriad of options, aren't there? Never got offered to do that. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm not going into too much detail with that one. All right. Yeah, no. yeah. No, no, never got asked to do that. So. Also, there's a, uh, a My Whoosh Association with the new team, so I imagine that um, they might call upon you to do a bit of rainbow jersey work at some point. Yes, well, it using is, the rainbow jersey. Even. Yeah, it's it is it's the esports world champion, not mm. the Zwift world champion. So, I, I I'm not sure what they'll want to do there. Mm. But yeah, at the end of the day, Bree's much more of the Zwift pro than I am. I think I've done two races, and Bree's done dozens pro know. races. That is mm. <laughs> not for a long time now. Yeah. Okay. Hey, it's been great to catch up. I, I, I expected just to get a quick overview of the new team, but we've just we've basically done uh, you know a, a pretty comprehensive chat about a lot of different things. And um, I might edit some of it for brevity, but I don't want to do a Velo News and just take thirty seconds of a forty-five minute interview. So, um, but I think that we've done a pretty good overview of uh, of the big uh, change that's about to come. Uh, I mean, there's going to be a lot of uh, learning experiences in the next little while. So hopefully we can stay in touch and you can sort of document that process. And um, again, congratulations on all you did the last couple of years. It's certainly um, a rapid coming of age. Um, says an old man who's been riding a bike since he was four. And never hey, really race, so. you're saying it to an old pro, apparently. <laughs> But uh, I wish you all the best for the next little while and um, and uh, it's probably a good time to go out and enjoy that Queensland weather and um, and, and maybe even jump in a pool and have a swim. Oh, mate, it's, it's so good finishing your ride, walking in the door, being handed your protein shake or your protein smoothie, drinking that as you're walking into the pool and then just jumping. <laughs> it's just, oh. You had it pretty good today. I did have it pretty good today. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, lap it up. It's going to get cold again in December, evidently, when you're going over to do your TT bike fitting. But um, yes. all the best. And uh, we'll uh, we'll see you on a Colnago eventually when the, when it ticks over the 1st of January. And I look forward to just continuing to follow this sort of fascinating journey that you're on. Definitely. Thanks, mate. Really appreciate it, especially with the timing and water and everything. So that's good. (laughs) No worries. All right. Well, uh, to be continued. Yep. Sounds good. Thanks, mate. Bye. Bye. Bye.